Are we live? Oh. We're live. We're, uh, <laughs> this is um, it's going to be a very interesting show, everybody. Calling Chris Anderson. Where are you, Chris? I am in uh, Newbury, Newbury, England. Newbury, England. So get, tell us some place that we've heard of that's not far from Newbury. Uh, we're about a half an hour from Aldbourne, where Easy Company was stationed. Uh, Easy Company. That was you know that? So yeah. Yeah. Isn't aren't, weren't there a lot of companies called Easy Company? I just weren't there. Well, one in okay. every. Okay. If you'd like to get in, if you'd like to get into the details, it's E Company, Second Battalion, Five Hundred Six Parachute Shoot Infantry Regiment, Regiment Hundred and First Airborne Division, and they were this little unit that actually like did things during the war. Oh, as opposed to units that use creativity <laughs> and performance to save many lives of other yes, units. Yes. Yes. And, and calling Rick Beyer in, uh, I don't know, you know, little little sarcastic camp. Where are you? Uh, <laughs> I am in, yes, the attitude is upon us today. Yes. Um, uh, I am in uh, uh, West Lebanon, New Hampshire. Of course uh, you are. And uh, I'm up here for my uh, 44th Dartmouth reunion. Good so I'm, I'm here uh, here in New Hampshire and, and hanging out. Uh, um, and, and, you know, somebody I saw up here uh, was one of our uh, History Happy Hour viewers, Jim Latin, wow, frequent yeah. commenter. Yeah, so he was here. And uh, you said he should be wearing a History Happy Hour hat. So as soon as, you, as soon as you get on that, Chris, and get making those History <laughs> Happy Hour hats, we can, we can get him wearing one. Uh, listen, welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Chris and I travel the globe, but we still try to be here every Sunday to have a cocktail, or in my case, a seltzer water in a Hilton Garden Inn paper cup, wow. um, uh, and talk about history. And today we're going to talk uh, with one of our favorite guests about a World War II era conflict that hardly anybody knows about. Do we, who's watching, Chris? Who's out there? Oh my God, we've got uh, Nancy Nylance here from Houston, Gene Templin from, uh, from sunny Pennsylvania, two words you don't usually see put together. Uh, Helen Lukash. Oh, uh, I saw Helen too. I could have put a picture of Helen up there. Well, Helen, I'm sorry I didn't put your picture. But you did, there. did you? You didn't. I didn't. It's a fail. But but hello, Helen. So we'll say hello. And uh, we also want to give a big thank you, of course, to everyone who supports us via Patreon, especially our top shelf supporters. Uh, you too can uh, waste your good money on History Happy Hour uh, by, go <laughs> by going to patreon.com slash history happy hour. We really have the good marketing slogans down, Chris, I think. Yeah, we do. That's why we're, uh, that's why we're you know, media that's, giants. That's why we're at the top of our game, international yeah. personalities fighting off the paparazzi yeah. <laughs> and doing all that good stuff we're doing. Have we, please tell me that I've, we've killed enough time. I think we have we definitely, We can actually yeah. get to the content of the, the show. The actual history, yes. Yeah, so why don't you, and listen, when we get to the other side of the open, there's no bell here. Don't give me a hard time about <laughs> it. But give me a cue. <laughs> Ding. Bing. Okay, I guess that'll work. The bar, the bar is, is open. open. So, full disclosure, we were going to talk about Watergate today in honor of the 50th anniversary of the Watergate break-in, which was Friday, was the 50th anniversary, but our guests couldn't make it, so we have completely switched gears and gone, you know, into, Even better. Some, into a, another direction, into something, instead of something everybody's heard of, something almost nobody's heard of, so it's going to be a show of discovery. Uh, in August 1939, as Hitler prepared to launch his panzers against Poland, the Soviet Union launched uh, kind of the final offensive of a border conflict against the Japanese army. And this is a, a kind of a battle and part of a series of battles. It's not very well remembered in the West, Chris, but they exert a significant impact on World War II. So it's sort of like the pre-war, you know, the prelude to World War II. And our guest today, uh, David Murphy, is making his fourth appearance on History he Happy Hour. He definitely needs a hat. He definitely needs uh, a hat. He, he, he asked for a retainer before well, we started the show. So, <laughs> silly boy. Yeah, we, we did agree to pay him uh, equal salaries with what we pay ourselves. So we, we, we solved that that way. But he is saving our butts by showing up today on uh, short notice to talk about a topic which he's writing a book about, 
but it hasn't even been published yet. So he's, you know, think of the sacrifice that David is doing here. So when his book comes out a year from now, I do expect everyone to buy it. So we will be, we'll be talking about that uh, when his book comes out. Uh, and he is a lecturer in military history and strategic studies at Maynooth University in Ireland. David Murphy, fourth time on History Happy Hour. Welcome. Thank you for having me, gentlemen, even if it's the, uh, this seems to be the cursed, the cursed program, is it? This is the King, the King Tutankhamun. We'll all, we'll all be dead by midnight. Kind of like, oh. Right, right, right. Well, we've had, we've had if already... You can, if you can survive this, David, then the next one, you know, it'll be like, you know, warm breezes and sunshine, so... You know, Chris, I say that myself every day, if I can survive today, you know, tomorrow it's all uphill and so, you know, we, are, we are still, you know, we still don't have somebody who's made five appearances on the show yet, but David, you're right in the running there. Mm with Joe Balkowski. One of you guys will be our first five-time guest. Okay. Just de depends on how much you pay us. So, uh, <laughs> you've, you've given me something to live for now. No, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. Um, when, we think of, when I think of 1939, I think of Stalin making his infamous deal with Hitler. Uh, I think of Hitler getting ready to invade Poland, but there's already a conflict that's been going on for a while on the far side of Russia that involves not only Russia and Japan, but apparently a couple of other armies as well. And I'm guessing that most folks uh, probably don't know a great deal about this. Uh, and the campaign even has two different names, depending on which side you talk to. So let's start out. What do we call this campaign? And give us uh, some context of what's going on here. I'll give you some context. I mean, it is, it's a very unusual one. Um, I got into it because I was kind of, I was looking at, uh, I, I've talked on the show before about the, 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 the Finland episode, which is late 39, so the Winter War in Finland. And it, it, in that kind of same phase, you, you see the Red Army, the Soviet Army getting involved in campaigns that are running up towards uh, World War II, as we know it. But they just disappear into that historical background. Uh, I mean, we've got September 39, we've got a basically a, a world war on our hands or so we're moving in that direction. So all this lesser, stu lesser stuff gets gets pushed into the background. But Kalkin Gaul is interesting. It's Kalkin Gaul. Um, it is like it is like it's like a Manassas Bull Run kind of deal. OK, if you were the Russians, it is named after a local town, which is Kalkin Gaul. If you are the, the Japanese, it is Namohan. And Namohan is what appears there's very, very little literature on this. There's a couple of, this is the, this is the, 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 the door stopper, numb on hand, numb on hand by, uh, hold on, bring that into the camera, David. There we go. Uh, that is uh, by Alvin Cooks. Uh, that's a 1990s book. Um, and he takes the numb on hand uh, title because he was working mostly from Japanese files, Japanese records. Up until the fall of the, the Iron Curtain, um, basically the Russian end of this story was closed to us. So there was, if, the, if, if histories did appear, it was from the Japanese perspective. Uh, from the 90s onwards, I mean, there were, there were a couple of very uh, interesting uh, research papers, uh, you know, developed in Fort Carlisle at Fort Leavenworth by U.S. Army officers on uh, the, 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 basically on the course or on staffs down there who were essentially looking at what the Russian methodologies were because the Russians are trying out their mechanized warfare in an area where they can actually use it. So it goes quite successful to them. To look at the big context, Mongolia, I mean, excuse me, if you do, if you do some research on Mongolia even today, it is, it is the largest landlocked country in the world. It is there, how can one describe it? It is kind of, you travel so far into Russia, then there's, it's sandwiched between Russia. There we go, there's a map. It's sandwiched between Russia, Mongolia, uh, then we've got this, this kind of like this China, there's Korea, and you know further out you've got the Japanese Empire. That's a, a kind of like a 1939 map, uh, but you can see where it is. The population of Mongolia today is less than four million, and it is the size of Turkey. Okay, Jeez. so it is a massive country, very little population, wide open space, wide open spaces. Now, why is that an area of contention? That is actually there's a long backstory here, and anyone who saw Vladimir Putin's kind of like. Uh, speech there in, uh, in February will be aware that the Russians have a long sense of history. Uh, but this goes all the way back to the, to the Convention of Peking in 1860, where that line is drawn up between, say, Russian sphere of influence and, Amer and China and emerging Japan. So there's a line drawn down kind of through Mongolia, through Mongolia. Uh, there, there's post-World War One. we have a Japanese intervention in the area. 
It is also an area of operations in the, the Russo-Japanese War, 1905, 1906. So there's a long back history there. And what we see emerging in the mid 1930s, you've got Russia, and then further to the east of Russia, you've got there's a Mongolian People's Republic, which essentially is a Soviet satellite. Okay, and then you've got a, 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 a another ja a Mongolian state called Manchukuo, which is a Jap it's Japanese occupied. It is Japanese puppet state, and then you've got Japan waging its war against China, and basically, you know in Manchuria, in that area. And we start pushing up against each other. There's a border dispute on the map, on the map, the border kind of like runs uh, about 10 miles to the east of a particular river, okay? Uh, and the Japanese reckon that the borderline should be on the river, okay? So they start pushing into uh, what is Mongolian People Republic territory, or effectively Soviet territory, they start pushing into that. Uh, there's a series of border incidents that the, the Soviets obviously pushed back. In the summer of 1938, they take, uh, they take some high ground in and around an area called Lake Kassan. There's a concentration there as well, and that essentially um, that bubbles out into a peace treaty. <coughs> Excuse me. But the Japanese, in the summer of 1939, the Japanese are feeling very confident, and they decide we're actually going to push this out. Now, we're going to push up to the river, take that territory and essentially see what happens. Okay, so that that is the point of confrontation, is in around that that demarcation line, in around the town of Kalkendal, very small town. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Good start. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so David, one of the things that um, I'd be curious to know a little bit more about is something about the opposing forces. Are these is this the Japanese army and the Red Army that we would recognize later once World War Two starts, or are these kind of different formations when they when they lock horns. No, this is pretty much I mean on the Japanese side, it's an it's Imperial Japanese Army. The protect the particular uh, army group responsible for that area is the Kwantung Army. Kwantung Army. Okay, and it's considered to be one of the more professional and more competent and also well equipped Japanese army groups, the Kwantung Army. Uh, the, the in terms of the, the immediate force in the area is the 23rd Japanese Division, okay? And we have the commanders here. Basically, within the, the Japanese command group, you can see people who have long experience going all the way back maybe 20 years previously, okay? The, the senior commanders, the colonels and the generals. And then you also have some junior commanders coming in here who will have a significant career in World War II. So that this is very much at a point where you're seeing a jump off here for people who will be involved in the Pacific campaign from 41 onwards. Equally, on the when you flick over to the, 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 the Russian side, it is essentially the 57th Special Corps, the 57th Special Corps, which is brought together initially under uh, Grigory Stern, and then Georgi Zukov is appointed as the, as the commander of that formation. And Zukov, as we know, uh, is, is a commander that will actually have a major impact in World War II. He's the, the, the Russian commander who will eventually uh, bring the Red Army into Berlin. And, you know, and he's significant at Stalingrad, he's significant at Kursk. He has, he has an interesting, he's had an interesting military career up to this point. He's, he was an enlisted man in World War I, becomes involved in the revolution, is active in the, 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 the Civil War. He is somebody who has a question mark over him from Stalin's point of view, and there's been, there's been, um, there's been kind of like possibilities of him being purged, okay? But he has not been purged, and he is there, and he will go on to do great things. Uh, the Japanese commander there is a man, uh, Komatsubara, uh, and he's uh, a different command styles here as well. I mean, Komatsubara seems to be quite a gentlemanly, soft-spoken uh, kind of man. He doesn't give orders, he gives suggestions, this kind of stuff. So. And that kind of interface, you see two totally different command styles in terms of the leading personalities and also how their actual command staffs operate. Uh, but yes, the, I mean, the simple answer to this is in terms of commanders and troops, there are people here you will see uh, will have significant careers either in Europe uh, on the Russian side or on the other side in the Pacific theater. And okay. um, numbers wise, I can give you numbers wise. I mean, the Japanese forces in around 20,000 for about this for this for this campaign. And there's an interesting they look and this, this kind of like has uh, impacts to other aspects of the campaign, they look at the Russian uh, position. And they recognize that the nearest railhead to the Russians is a 600 kilometer round trip away. 
Okay, and they do some metrics on this, and they reckon that 20,000 in their army is enough, that the Russians are not going to be able to bring in extra people to, to kind of get critical mass against them. But the final Russian forces in, ter in, in that area are about 70,000. Okay. So this is a large engagement. This, 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 this large is not... Engagement. Yeah, and you, and when you crunch some of the other numbers, I mean, the, the Russians will eventually. I say this is crucial. I mean, the the, the the logistics or the logs issue is crucial in all this, in terms that they, they look at this, and the Japanese have all these quite quite sophisticated metrics, and they're based on their late Kassan experiences and on earlier performances of the Russian army, and they say they won't be able to bring in people, and they won't be able to bring in material, they won't be able to bring in more artillery, whatever, so we're okay. Kwantung and army can deal with this. Um, but Zukov really galvanizes the whole logistics effort, has 24-hour cycles of guys in, in trucks. The Russians have significantly more ra uh, road transport, um, and they're basically running all night, bringing up people, bringing up uh, artillery, bringing up tanks, um, so eventually they will have uh, it's they will have more men they will have about 500 tanks to the Japanese have less than a hundred and also quality in terms of quality the Russian tanks are better you know Russian tanks are better they're equal in artillery terms they're in around equal they're in around equal but a lot of the later Russian uh, cannons brought in have a greater range and the Russians can also bring a fantastic amounts of ammunition to actually fire against them. I mean, some of the Japanese guns are reduced to, they can fire for maybe 10, 12 rounds a day. And the Russians are throwing out these fantastical, you know, multi-thousand round artillery battles, yeah. just this crazy stuff. Um, and then also the Russians have a significant edge in terms of aircraft. Um, but it all comes down to that single logs hub. Uh, Japanese look at it say, this is safe. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be a runner for the Russians, but it is. No bad, bad planning. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> there are so my understanding here is and, and let, let, just put it right out there I'm not super uh, knowledgeable about this because I'm going to read your book but you haven't published it yet so that's put me at a disadvantage I've been written it yet buddy <laughs> uh, and, uh, but there are other armies involved here not necessarily in the uh, in the conflict that uh, in the Soviet attack in, in August of 1939 but in this conflict you, we also as you said there's two Mongolias yeah. right there's a uh, Mongolia and then um, uh, Japanese Mongolia, Manchukuo, those, th those have armies involved in this conflict as well, don't they? They do. I mean, this, the, the army of Manchukuo, which is the Japanese, basically the Japanese vassal state, so they have troops involved in this. Uh, they're, they're equipped with Japanese equipment, so they will have some kind of, not only small arms and artillery, but some of their armor and uh, armored car units will be, will be Japanese supplied. And then the Mongo Mongolian People's Republic Army will have a significant force. And what you, quite often what you see, and that side, the Soviet side as well, they're equipped with Russian equipment, particularly Russian armored cars, which they make very good use of, make very good use of. Uh, what you see in the early phases when this actually kind of like breaks out is that the initial contests or contests are usually between the two Mongolian forces and then the Japanese and the Soviets are sucked in. Okay, the, the, the Soviets do an assessment of this and they realize that this is going to become, uh, it's going to become very serious. So they decide they're going to back the Mongolian People's Republic to the hilt. And they start pouring troops in. But the initial phases, they are Mongolian troops and Mongolian troops with increasing numbers of being being backed up either with Japanese or Soviets. So, so David, would you say that, you know, one of the, you know, I've, I've read a lot about the Pacific. I lead our tour in the Pacific. And one of the things that I find when I look at the Japanese is they often have what they would like to have happen as their plan, but they don't really have a plan. They don't, you know, it seems very uh, kind of wish-based instead of reality-based. Do they have a clear set of goals in mind when they're when they're advancing through here, or are they just kind of knocking on the door and let's hope for the best? Or what's their their aim here? Well, I, th I think when you look from the top down, there's an interesting kind of like their command structure is quite fractured in terms of the messaging that's coming from from Tokyo. Pretty much throughout, throughout this period is to kind of can we de-escalate this and can we shut this down? Right. And that comes to the headquarters, Kwantang Army, and they kind of interpret it differently that we keep we're keeping the game. <laughs> and then even you know even some of the, the 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 junior more you know formation commanders, the Japanese are even more aggressive again. When you I mean in all part it plays part of this, you know, and in the wider strategic picture for the Japanese at, at this time. Bear in mind they're in a war with China since 1931. Right. 
Mm. And the, the messaging, again, from Tokyo is kind of, we're kind of quite heavily engaged in Manchuria. Can we just keep this area contained and quiet? But right. the guys keep upping the ante and pushing on in. When you, when you look at it on the map, um, there's no, apart from, uh, if you're in the business of gaining territory, you know, right. and, and square miles, you know, great. This is great. But if you look at it on the map, there's nothing there. That's right. That's right, owners. Yeah. And, and you can push in. You can have you can have success, and you can push in and keep on pushing into into that area of Mongolia. But there's nothing there. The only benefit it has is to be tweaking Russia's nose, and if they if the Russians perform bad, showing them showing them up badly, maybe capturing some of their equipment, and you know having it have a, an effective kind of like counter morale boost for your troops. But strategically, there's nothing there. There's nothing. There. <laughs> Well, and the kind of a reverse question here from one of our viewers, Wally Morrison, who wants to know, did the Russians have any sense of caution or uh, their own sense of getting even, trying to tweak the Japanese because of the Japanese, uh, the disaster of the 1904-1905 uh, Japanese-Russia war? Yeah, they, I mean, I think there's definitely a sense of, you know, the, the Russia-Japanese war has a long shadow. And then bear in mind that kind of like, you know, the Allied intervention force that goes into Russia in 1918, 1919, uh, Japanese troops land at Vladivostok. Mm. You know, they push into Russia there again. So there's a deep sense of grievance. So the idea of pushing them out, I mean, from the... The, the, the strategic goal from the Russian side is actually a bit more realistic because the, the Japanese Manchukuo, Japanese Mongolia, is smaller territory. So you could actually conceivably push them out of that and unify all of Mongolia You could, as a Soviet Republic. Uh, you could actually conceivably do this. But yeah, I mean, I think very much uh, wanting to test the Japanese and, and hopefully show them up, which they, they do eventually in a very... In a very Russian style. <laughs> <laughs> very Russian style. Okay. So, you know, I, I don't want to get too far afield, and if this this takes us there, you know, kind of reel me back in. But speaking of the Kwantung Army, these guys seem to be a real loose cannon in terms of, of Japanese foreign policy. They they seem to have their own agenda. Why do you think that they're given such a free reign? I mean, they, they kind of, you know, they do things which mess up Japanese foreign policy. And then, you know, they get a slap on the wrist, but then they kind of keep doing it. Why do you think that there's not more of an effort to sort of rein these guys in? I suppose, I mean, you're looking at the, the, office, the officer group who are probably most difficult to handle are uh, probably some of the best operators in the Japanese army at the time. And if you do some kind of, if you do some kind of Soviet purge on them, you really are losing some of your best people. I think yeah. there's also a huge advantage for them, kind of like the distance they are operating from Tokyo. And messages are coming through, and they're deciding to. Uh, you, you see, some of the stuff that some of the messaging that comes through is actually reasonably vague. So I think you could, if it came to a court martial scenario, they could be forgiven and saying, "Well, no, that's not how I." <laughs> right. You know, when they're, they're talking, I mean, Tokyo is talking about we want this, we want this situation, this incident brought to a resolution. Now, so what does that mean? Does that mean you put up your hands or does that mean you go and beat the enemy? They right. choose to take the latter interpretation. And there's also this kind of culture growing up in the, particularly not so much in the Navy, but definitely in the Japanese Army at the time of, um, I suppose, what would we call it today? Speaking truth to power. Okay. Where you have, you've got younger officers, lesser grade officers, who are actually turning to generals and saying, no, sir, you're, that's a bad idea, and you know, et cetera, talking back to, to their senior command. Um, yeah. And that has that has been a situation that's emerging in the Japanese army from the uh, definitely from the early mid thirties. It's gone unchecked. It's gone unchecked. So there's a certain amount of loose cannonism. This is not the time to put a lid on that. Yeah, yeah. So, so my understanding of this is that there, there's a there's been a kind of a low level conflict for a while. It's become more high level. The Japanese are sort of trying to push in. Uh, and Stalin gets uh, unhappy with the fact that this is ongoing because he's got other stuff going on that he'd uh, rather not worry about this and that he summons Zukov to go command and basically says, make it go away, destroy them, you know, d do that. And is it true, David, that Zukov thought that uh, when he was summoned that he was actually possibly going to be arrested and interrogated, not that he was going to be promoted and given a job? Yeah, I think that's yeah, that seems to be true. I mean, that seems to be everyone's experience in that period. If you, I mean, this is the height of the purges. 
this is when you know the, the, the you know if you get a telegram telling you to come to Moscow, <laughs> it's not a good deal. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not a holiday weekend or something. Uh, yeah, it's not kind of a, come out to the Dasha. We'll have a few drinks and have a few laughs. <sighs> it's not that kind. of People like you know, people like Chukachevsky, like Mikhail Chukachevsky, who we talked about before in this program. You know, one of our leading strategists is invited to, to Moscow for a, a meeting and ends up court-martialed and dead. So yeah, he, he he's expecting the worst. And if you look at Zukov's papers, there's a, a it's not a farewell letter, but there's definitely a semi-farewell letter written to his wife around this time. That mm. he's going, he doesn't know what's going to happen, and he's going. And he gets the job. It has been, I mean, this has been happening now for, God, you know, since the mid-1930s. You know that old phrase that we have of the campaigning season that sometime in, in along the Mongolian border, sometime around April and May, you would start getting these cavalry patrols clashing. Uh, it's escalated quite seriously in 1938, and now it seems to be happening again. Um, uh, Grigory Stern has been the man on the spot initially in May when it starts starts heating up again, and Stalin just says, "No, we're going to get the uh, basically who's the hardest head I have," and he calls Zukov in and says, "Look, go send him a message, whatever whatever mafia term you want to use, send him a message, fix this, fix this now," okay. and he gets pretty much. He pretty much gets unlimited supply in terms of men, equipment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and he gets told to go do it. So, so David, you know, you know, as Rick said at the start of the show, um, you know, there's not a lot of people that even have heard of this conflict before. Um, but at the time, uh, you know, obviously you know, things are heating up all over the world. Uh, the world is on edge of you know going into slipping into world war. Are, are other powers talking about this conflict then? I mean, is Hitler, is, are, are the Western allies, are, are they aware of it? Are they worried about it? Or what do they think about this? Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, it's picked up. It's picked up in obviously government circles and, and defense circles and, 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 and people are, there's an eye on this. And it's, there's a certain amount of, I suppose we call it espionage through embassy setups trying to get up as close as possible to this to see what's going on. Gets a certain amount of media attention as well, and I, by that I mean the press. And you're leaving. I think there's a bit of pathy news footage on this as well. But people, so it's the summer of '39, and we know what the world is like then. It's it's tense all over the world. And bear in mind that since I think it's '36, the Germans and the Japanese have had a pact, have had a defense pact. Right. So people standing back and taking the macro view of this are saying, what is what is it about to begin here? Is Russia about to be squeezed between Germany and Japan? Which is partly the reason the Japanese are feeling themselves are feeling so confident. Is there going to be a big squeeze on here? Is this beginning of, you know, a, a push into the Pacific? Just what's actually going to happen? Yeah, so yeah, it gets a lot of world attention. But then that's all in, in the kind of the longer process as we look across Europe and the, the kind of like the Czechoslovakian deal and the Munich crisis and where, where, where you know, it's it's just all bad. We're just it's moving cool. towards that kind of like that, that Polish scenario in September yeah, yeah. of 39. Yeah. So this fight also has a, a, a pretty significant air war uh, that is part of it. Uh, I mean, and Russia's got the uh, advantage in that, but there's a... This is something else that is kind of presaging some of what's going to happen in uh, later in World War II, isn't it? It is. I mean, you, you, you've got the, the, the photograph of Polykarpov there on the left, the Russian Polykarpov and the Japanese fighters. The one that is termed, I think it's the K-27. It's known in, in um, kind of like it's given the designation later on as the Nate. I think that's the Nate fighter. Um, so there's huge interest in this. I mean, the Russians have some serious numbers there in terms of aircraft the japanese not quite so much they have about i'd say they probably have about 60 percent of what they, they have they're around 400 aircraft and the, the russians have about 900 to a thousand so that's the kind of like ratio but i mean the two fighters on screen there were considered at that time as being cutting edge uh, top tier fighters okay and now Obviously, that is going to be turned on its head in 1940, 1941. They will, it'll be very quickly revealed that they are both actually obsolescent fighters at this stage. But there's a huge interest amongst, uh, you know, the general public, but also defense staffs looking at this. It's, it's, we really seeing, we've had a certain amount of air operations in the Spanish Civil War, but not on this scale, not to modern armies, modern states basically pitching in their air forces uh, to battle each other. So people are looking at it in terms of the equipment, what's working, what's not working. Uh, fighter strategies, you know, bombing strategies, there's a certain amount of bombing that, that takes place in this as well. Uh, regulated only really by the fact there's so little to bomb. Uh, 
<laughs> you have to choose your targets carefully. I mean, there's a certain amount of tactical stuff goes on, but you know, if you're in a strategic bombing squadron, you've nowhere to go. You know, it's a uh, you know, bombing, bombing a tractor factory somewhere. I don't know. But I mean, those but, those fighter numbers are not terribly far off from Battle of Britain fighter Britain. numbers. And some people like on both sides, both Japanese sides and and and, and the Soviet side, you they create their aces. They create their first round of aces. Um, and you got people like clocking up 30, 40, 50 kills. Uh, and they will go forward in generally speaking, what you're looking at on the Russian side, these are all people who will who will be dis will disappear in nineteen forty one when the when the Luftwaffe arrives on the scene. They don't really survive that initial phase because the plane is outdated and also uh, you know, they're just overwhelmed. But some of the and the Japanese cases, some of those the Japanese fighter pilots are still in action all the way up to forty four, forty five. Some of, there's a one there's a couple of guys who actually um, survived the war and will go on to become uh, you know kind of like leading officers in the the revived uh, Japanese air defense uh, after World War two so That's yeah crazy. some significant characters who would show up in the Pacific campaign so, so David just um, just kind of broadly speaking I know there's a lot there and we want people to buy the book once you write it uh, <laughs> <laughs> what um, can you just give, give us kind of a broad sense of, of the course of the campaign you know what how, how does it all sort of unfold and what sure you know, winners mean, and losers and yeah i mean ultimately the, the, we, i will give our bottom line up front ultimately the japanese are the loser here okay and mm -hmm. they, they have to you know various reasons they're they're they're, they're running out of steam in august of 1939 and we'll talk about but and then the political backdrop as well pushes them into a settlement Settled. But essentially, what this has happened, this runs between May, June, July, and August. And essentially, what you can see in the the um, kind of like in May, you're looking at kind of border clashes, cavalry clashes. You're looking at um, you're looking at kind of like armored cars attacking each other, usually along the Kalkengal River, and you know no no kind of like no serious. Um, uh, no serious outcome. It's quite pretty much a stalemate. They're playing off against each other. Uh, June, July, and particularly in July, the Japanese decide that the other side's soft, and they, they put in some major offensives. Okay, and they put in a major offensive just after Zukov arrives, and that's a that's an interesting affair, because essentially what happens is they cross the river. They put up a couple of pontoon bridges. They're limited in what they can get across in terms of their own tanks and their own heavy stuff. Uh, Zukov basically counter moves with his um, with his armored brigades, and he puts those in. He essentially sacrifices them to stop the Japanese assault. Loses heavily in tank numbers. He puts them forward without proper infantry support. And we realize now, going back and looking at his writings and his and his reports at the time, that was a conscious decision. Okay, he just looks at it and he said, "You know, I'm going to I'm going to commit these guys. I, I can't get in the infantry back up. You know, you know." quick enough etc etc they're going to take casualties but it's worth it to stop the japanese the japanese essentially have done a basically try to do an encirclement they have a north and a south uh, a north and a south wing the north is slightly successful the southern sweep is just stopped okay but it's huge huge uh, casualties and it's interesting that at that point you're really seeing two different armies operating um i mean zukov is bringing together his armor his mechanized units his mechanized infantry, mechanized artillery, air power, he's all bringing them together. The Japanese army is still essentially an infantry army. Their, their view of um, the tanks, the use of tanks, is really as infantry support. Okay, and it, it, that's, the, that's a crucial split in the two kind of like uh, philosophies here, so to speak, on the battlefield. The, 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 the Soviets are running for modern arm, or moving towards modern uh, armored warfare. The, 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 the Japanese are really, it's an infantry heavy army with armor support uh, and that shows itself in those battles that said japanese are incredibly tenacious in terms of uh, basically how they fight in general how they will try to recapture high ground how they will do anti-tank without really being equipped for any anti-tank and um, they will they will swarm across uh, russian tanks they will use petrol bombs they will lever open hatches and throwing hand grenades, and, you know, and that is a casualty. That's, I mean, that's a great image. That's a, that's a great image. But that kind of idea where your your group of infantry decide to take out a tank, old style, so to speak, it's casualty heavy. But but you have success in this. I mean, at the end of the day, the the, the, the Russians lose something like 
I, I think it's it's over it's almost 300 tanks it's 250 tanks and then more kind of like armored cars on top of that as well so they, they suffer heavily so that's kind of like so that's the japanese attack really kind of like june july now what happens then is that the russians bring up and this is the very russian style they bring up uh, a lot of artillery and most of the artillery is long range stuff okay that the japanese do not have the range to respond to um, they bring up fantastic amounts of ammunition and they pulverize japanese lines for you know a number of weeks and then Zukov launches, uh, 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 basically, it's, I have a map of it there, if you can bring it up. It's a double envelopment. He has, he describes it afterward after the, uh, that ancient, the, the, the Roman Carthaginian battle. He says, I fought a Cannae battle. He's done the, 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 the double loop. Um, and he essentially crushes the, the, the 22nd or the 23rd Japanese infantry division. And it's all over. Essentially, it's all over. And that's so, an over. <clears throat> Well, so uh, there's there's a couple of sixty four thousand dollar questions here, and uh, the first one I'll ask in a in a broad way: uh, Are there lessons learned in this fighting, uh, either good ones or bad ones, uh, that impact either side uh, involved in the fighting in the war? Yes, I mean let's take it from the Russian side. The Russians do a lessons learned on this, and they reckon they they have a metric here for modern armored warfare. Okay, air support and everything like that, blitzkrieg kind of thing, everything you do with your air power to start with, artillery support, armoured and mech, they reckon they have it, they have it nailed. But the downside to all this is then it's it's the same Red Army, it's just different groups of the Red Army go to war against Finland in, um, you know, basically November, a few months later, and they come to grief because the terrain is different. The opposition is different. The climate is different. So having got very, very confident, the Russians get extremely confident after this. And this is one of the reasons that the short circuit, their planning cycle for Finland, Stalin is very, very confident. And he basically just says, look, obviously, if we can beat the Japanese army over at Kalkin Gaul, we can easily take on the Finns. Go. We have it sorted. Uh, and it's not quite that easy. Okay, the two. What we discover in that, in that phase is that the two, the Red Army is not all the same. Not all Red Army generals are the same. Not all conscripts are, have been trained to the same level. Okay, and not everybody's following the doctrine as it should be. And then throw in the train of Finland and the train of uh, Mongolia. Slightly different. Slightly different. So there's there's there's, there's a false optimism there amongst the, the 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 Red Army. On the Japanese side, they go through a serious kind of like cycle after this of reflecting of what's what's actually happened. Okay, what's actually happened to them. And I think the key thing about this is the, the strategic shift in, you know, following this and various other events around this, we can talk through them if you want. But the, 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 the Japanese focus has been kind of predominantly China, Russia, the idea of pushing westwards across and putting Russia under pressure. After this, they decide to totally refocus on what they call strike force south. Uh, so it's going to be the Pacific. And that requires, that plays to their their strengths. It doesn't require an armoured doctrine, really. It requires good infantrymen, and they have got good, resilient infantrymen who can exist and fight in jungles and, and, and survive and so on and so forth. Um, so they go through a, a, a lessons learned as well, but in the context of where they they have decided to actually operate for the next few years, they get the advantages out of this, you could argue. Yeah. Does that make sense, Rick? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I, I want to yeah. pick up on that, because it's interesting... If you look at both armies, of course, as soon as the the big war, quote unquote, starts, uh, the performance of the Red Army is pretty abysmal, yeah. uh, and the performance of the Japanese Army is pretty outstanding. Um, and it's just interesting that those outcomes are sort of reversed on what we're talking about here. Yeah. I mean, on the, on the Russian side, you're looking at the, you know they're, they're trying to fight armored warfare, but for various things, it's not going well for them. And in you know in the West, in in when they when they get feel Barbarossa and Blitzkrieg, they're playing against an enemy that's at the top of its game. Really, yeah. it is at the top of its game, and they suffer badly. Whereas to a certain extent, what the Japanese engage in, you know, kind of as they push into the Pacific, is is really an infantryman's battle. It's an infantry army. It suits that kind of environment. Right. Um, and there's bigger strategic stuff. I mean, as this as the battle is reaching reaching its point of culmination, so to speak. Uh, in August, and, and the, the Japanese are suffering badly. And um, the big surprise for them is that all of a sudden it's announced that we have the the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. That you know Germany, 
but the big strategic sense, they've been kind of like operating, thinking we have a, we have a German ally, we're going to squish Russia between the two of us. And then all of a sudden, it, they read in the newspapers, and they really do read in the newspapers, <laughs> that the Russians and the Germans have now signed a non-aggression pact because they have another plan to basically cut up Europe between themselves. So that takes the heat out of the that takes the heat out of the Japanese operation hugely. They're being they're being challenged on the ground. Strategic landscape has changed, and they go into a reset. And then they decide, 1940, 1941. If we're pushing anywhere, it's going to be down towards, you know, Malaya, Burma, Dutch East Indies, Dutch East Indies oil, rubber, that kind of stuff. You know, direction of Australia, and ultimately for America as well. This is what moves them into your sphere of interest. Right. Um, right. You know, that you just logically thinking. In that kind of like that new kind of like strategic mindset, the big contender that they have to now worry about is the U.S. Okay, yeah. so Calc and Gold, you could be could well argue, moves their focus from their big main enemy being Russia to in the future their big main enemy is going to be America. But you've you've got to wonder though. I mean, if if they get defeated by the Russians, why aren't they saying okay? Well, if the Russians have industrial might and tanks and all these other things. Maybe going after the United States is going to be an even worse situation. Yeah, yeah no, I think it's it's all it's all to do with the timeline. I mean, the Russians are all are already kind of by thirty nine are already in mass producing, a mass producing stuff. America has that capacity, but hasn't switched over to that capacity okay, right. yet. So I think I mean, it's a it's it's ult, it's the ultimate strategic gamble, isn't it? Right. If you don't pull this off within two years. You're screwed. Game over. And, yeah. and that's what happens. I mean, that ultimately, that's what happens. Um, and then the long game between in 41, 41, Japan and Russia, Soviet Russia, this, this sign up a, a non aggression deal between themselves and they will not confront each other along the Mongolian border. And they actually don't go to war until August of 45, after the bomb has been dropped in Hiroshima, etc. Then Russia mm -hmm. declares war. On, on Japan and sweeps into Manchuria into its special operation. <laughs> it's, it's, it's You're referred, setting up another show, David. <laughs> but it's, it's it's referred to something. It's something along those lines. It's referred to as a, you know, as a special military operation or the Manchurian military operation, something right. like that. Well, uh, you know, in the uh, is there a is there a, a, a an alternate history here? If somehow the Japanese um, uh, defeat the Russians, if Zhukov isn't sent in, if something else happens, does it does it push things in a different direction significantly, or does it sort of sort of will the rest of the pieces of World War II kind of fall the same way? I, I, I mean, there's an interesting counterfactual there. I mean, if they have a finished situation in in Mongolia, if it all comes off the rails for them in, in Mongolia and they're, they're defeated there, what does that mean for Soviet Ru Russia? Um, do they then push into Finland then later on that year or do they just sit licking their wounds? Uh, or, you know, is it a situation where uh, Germany refocuses, decides to go against Russia rather than the rest of Europe in 3940? I mean, if there's a significant Japanese victory in Mongolia, does does Hitler actually say, actually, hang on a second here? I have an existing alliance with Japan. We will we will now actually squeeze Russia. So there is a possibility there. I think if that had all come off the rails. So so why do you think? And again, this is a question I, I come to quite a bit um, when I look at the war in the Pacific. Why do you think that they're not squeezing Russia more? I mean, I know when I was doing some reading before the show. There's one uh, Soviet marshal who says, if the Japanese enter the war on Hitler's side, our cause is hopeless. Why don't you think there's more kind of coordination between uh, the Germans and the Japanese? Because I think, obviously, it would have benefited both Axis powers and both of their... Yeah, I think the, I, so I think the key thing that, that, breaks down, that breaks down there is actually you know, is the distance between the two of them. I mean, we see this all the way, we see this all the way to the end where, like, even in, in aspects such as the nuclear program where they're trying to share the information and then Germany starts trying to share some technology. And it's just the vast distances between two sides and coordinating that um, without without your kind of like your communications and your, your etc yeah. being intercepted and, and, and deciphered I think it's just it's an it's an impossible uh, it's an impossible ask to coordinate what needs to be coordinated I think in yeah. terms of modern technology if they had more 
real-time communications and better real-time communications, then it starts looking viable. But just with the with the equipment, etc., that you had at the time, I just don't think you could do it. So if you think about it, you know, you can't have a cable from Germany to Japan unless it runs, you know, around Russia, India, and, and China, right? So, how, so communications immediately is very, very difficult. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's other side of the world stuff. I mean, yeah. it, it would challenge us today if if, if somebody decided, you know. I, I want to basically coordinate a military operation between, you know, the West and somewhere deep in Asia. It would be challenging today. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of the technology that's available there. You know. um, David, there's a, a question that, that actually kind of refers to, to kind of takes us back in history a little bit, but from Skip Cornett. Uh, who says, uh, uh, you know, how, how does Japanese, how does Japan kind of go from being one of the allies the uh, during the First World War to being fighting against a lot of its uh, former allies uh, in the Second World War. Uh, uh, you know, what, what happens there? Uh, what's motivating Japan in a sort of a broader strategic way? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many peculiarities in that. I mean, somebody pointed this out to me recently that in World War One, when Australian troops are being convoyed over uh, towards well, a lot of them end up in, in kind of like places like the Middle East, whatever else, but also Europe. Uh, quite often, they're escorted by the Japanese Navy, which is you know, <laughs> the irony of ironies there. Ah. And then there's also that famous. There's a great photograph if, you, if people want to Google it, and it's Vladis, Vladivo, Vladivostok Allied intervention. Google something like that, and it's a parade through Vladivostok, and the flags outside the town hall are kind of like America, France, Britain, and Japan, because they're the they are the main contenders there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think when you look at Japan comes out of World War One feeling kind of dissatisfied with the results. It comes out and um, doesn't feel it's had a, a, a big enough voice at the table, at the Versailles table. And um, doesn't feel it's kind of, it's got some of the German colonies in the Pacific. Doesn't feel as though it's gotten enough. So that's a, a, an element of discontent. Um, and then also when you see where Japanese society goes in the 20s and 30s, it's it, you know, in the 20s, the, the British are still sending an awful lot of uh, Navy and air missions over to Japan to help them to do all, all kinds of things, everything from operating submarines and equipment to how to use parachutes properly. You know, there's an irony in that, you know, that the, 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 the Japanese Air Force and the Japanese Navy and naval aviators were trained by, you know, British instructors how to bail out of planes. So, <laughs> I bet they wish you'd cut that program. Come <laughs> So this, this, there's, a, there's a gradual shift in Japanese society, and you can see it becoming more authoritarian, more ambitious, uh, more militaristic, and that even that even filters down to how they're educating their children, and the whole Bushido code and sacrifice to the emperor. So there's a hardening, there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a, a cooling of the friendship between, particularly between the U.S. and Britain. Okay, and then there's this hardening in society. And I think in the, the Pacific area, they have ambitions and they have ambitions for all those resources. They look at all these empires, the British, the French, the Dutch, and they see. Oh, did we lose him? He's frozen. Oh, David, are you still there? We lost. Yep. Yep. We lost the very end of what you said, the last sentence. OK, the last. No, I was just thinking, I mean, I think in, in, that, in that kind of. Okay, you know we 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 thought the show was cursed, but then we got through forty-five minutes without the curse, and then suddenly. We're just gonna. Tutan Kamun as rare as Suddenly we've been hit. Um, uh, so, David, we're kind of losing you a little bit here. I was actually just trying to bring in uh, the photo that you were talking about, um, and I think I can find it here if you hang on one second. Don't blow it up. Uh, uh, I know, really. What happens if uh, if I can't make it go? I don't know. But um, the photo of the Japanese marching in Vladivostok. There we uh, go. And there you go. And all the flag. I, I, it's fa there's the rising sun. And then what are all the, the, 
the U.S. flag, the the whole the whole schmear there. Yeah, you've and got the, the you got the Japanese flag. The next one along is the British flag, but it's the British Navy flag. Navy flag. Okay, yeah. which shows their their co their contingent there, France and America. There you go, the big four players in Vladivostok. And it all changes uh, in twenty years after that. Yeah. But um, I think you're, if you're looking you're looking at that, I mean, and it's, it sounds very Machiavellian, but if you think you're looking at the twenties and thirties, you know, French Empire is 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 very visibly uh, tottering. British Empire as well, the Dutch, you know, kind of like, you know, are talking. So if you're Japan, your big problem in the Pacific is America. You know, it really is America. And you've got a, a limited timeline to snaffle up as much resources as you can and basically subdue America before America industrial capacity kicks in and <coughs> you're screwed. Uh, I mean, I think that's the, the basic metric there. Yeah. So, so David, you know, one of the things um, that I also found interesting when I was kind of doing some background reading on this is, you know, this this front or this theater doesn't go away uh, and troops are still left there. So looking at the kind of the course of World War II as, as, it, as it goes on, what sort of importance does this have? I mean, I, I mean, the armies are still facing each other. Do both sides send guys to hang out in Mongolia while the war is being fought or is... Yeah, you've, you know, you've got troops pacing there. Can, can, I don't, is that a good or a bad thing if you're a Japanese or a Russian soldier? If you, if you spend the years between <laughs> right. 1941 and 45, um, you know, on the Mongolian or Manchurian front, it's. Uh, I it's might nice take that. You know? Yeah, I might take that posting if the alternative is Stalingrad. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's it is. It, you could argue that all all boats that are doing are tying up people that they could do with elsewhere. Okay? Right. But neither of them can afford to stand back because both sides are afraid that. If I decided to start catching troops from this and sending them to the Pacific or sending them to Stalingrad, then my opposition will decide to 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 front up on this, yeah. uh, and it does become a, a, a quite a very short, but fairly hectic area of activity. Then right at the end of of World War Two, July August forty five, the yeah. Japanese were essentially pushed out and pushed out of Manchuria, um, and then on the far side of that, we have we have a full Mongolia. We have a Mongolia without Japanese influence. But it is part of the USSR, so it gets it gets its entirety back, but as a satellite state of the USSR. Right. Uh, we've talked about this on a previous show, but it turns out that Russia is involved in a war these days. Uh, oddly uh, enough, and uh, um, I wonder if. Um, there are any lessons from this conflict that you think we might apply to the situation in Ukraine as we look at it, which may not be lessons we want to uh, to face. But are there any? Is there anything there that strikes you? I think there's, there's two key ones. I would actually say. I mean, and the first one is simply this, and I'm not being I'm not being flippant here, but the Russian long sense of history and grievance. Uh, and quite often, I mean, I mean, Putin has manifested this out of Ukraine, but we've seen it even say, like, say, you say Chechnya. Uh, Chechnya was it was a situation that they got into in the 19th century. So that is like it's pre-Russian Federation, it's pre-USSR, it's Romanov dynasty stuff, and they seem to to stay in these stay in in, in obsessed with these legacy issues centuries later and regimes later so they seem to kind of they hold the grudge despite the fact that the regime has changed several times they still find themselves at death of these locations and i don't think that you can break their attention away from these places very easily so i think that's what i think that long sense of history and grievance spliced together i think the other one uh, i think the other one uh, and we see this manifested now that the 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 russian people have an incredible ability to uh, endure suffering and inflict it. Mm. Okay, there's there's literally once they open the ball, there seems to be no bottom that they will go to in terms of their own casualties that will make them call stop. You look at what they're. I mean, we're all, we're at guesstimations in terms of numbers. What's happening in Ukraine? Um, you know, any other Western nation would have would have sought a peace process out of this by now, and they're still on it. Mm. Some of the stuff that's been inflicted on Ukrainians, you I mean any other country would pause and think very carefully about itself at this stage, not the Russians. So inflicting and enduring suffering, there seems to be limitless capacity there. That's a very cheerful way to end our, our yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, yes, and on that cheerful note, uh, uh, David Murphy, uh, thank you so much for joining us today for your fourth 
history happy hour. The check is in the mail. And um, uh, um, and uh, we hope to have you back on soon, but probably not next week or the week no, after. We promise. We, we promise. We, 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 we'll, we'll give you, uh, this gives you, buys you at least three weeks of immunity from History Happy Hour. Um, and I want to add that uh, David's, David's book about the Kalkin Goal is uh, coming out in 2023. We absolutely promise to promote the living heck out of it when it does to... Uh, to uh, as as our payoff, I mean our our gratitude for uh, for your appearance today. But David, thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, David. Really, really nice appreciate it. It was it, it was excellent. Thank you. Keep safe. Thank you. You too, my friend. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we we've 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 burned another fifty five minutes. Uh, you know, that was never. It was no, it was very interesting. I um, and I thought some of those some of those lessons are a little scary, right? I mean, Aren't they? Uh, you apply to today and say, uh, you know, Russia's answer is usually to double down and send in the new Grigory Zukov and a new set of artillery and new million and, shells. And so, what, so, what's the lesson in all this? Pay attention in history class. That's Same. exactly right. Although they didn't teach any of this in any history class I was <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Part of. So pay attention to the parts of history that you usually somehow get ignored. Uh, Chris, next week we are going to have on uh, the former uh, Supreme Commander of NATO, uh, but not really to talk about that so much, but to talk about his book, uh, The Sailor's Bookshelf, which is 50 Books to Know the Sea. So I guess we'll be finding out about uh, good books about going to the sea, and maybe we'll we'll manage to slip a couple of strategic uh, issues in there as well with Admiral James Stavridis. So that should be very interesting. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm betting Patrick O'Brien is in there. Yeah, I'm thinking Master and Commander is one of them, and Moby Dick, and uh, what what you know, uh, we'll have not to the go, we'll, not the Ghost Army. Then. And we'll have <laughs> <laughs> inflatable battleships. Uh, well, I don't know. We, I, you know, I I don't like inflatable battleships as much as I liked the uh, aircraft carriers made out of ice that uh, uh, that Mont Batten was proposing. I, I want to know. I had a question though about this. So I saw that you posted a video of the new Ghost Army exhibit at the Illinois Holocaust Museum, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that they have way more cool inflatables than you have. So how did it happen? I thought you were like Mr. Inflatable, but they have more than you have. Well, they have the same number that I have. They don't actually have more. But, uh, but they have know, different varieties. They do, although they're all made by the same person who is a wonderful person named Tony McKay. Uh, and her company, Starbound Entertainment. So we'll give them a plug in Newcastle, oh. Pennsylvania. And she is, she's got a few of her own as well. Uh, I was just has. curious so about that because I, you know. We can I soon thought. put an army together of, of inflatables and uh, maybe we'll find that useful in some future History Happy Hour parade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no, please. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, great show today. And thank you again to David Murphy. And everybody, thank you very much for joining us. We're so glad you did. And we will see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe.